You, you know, I, I, uh, I thank the Lord that one thing I know more than I know anything else is God will never let go. Um, and I praise him for that. Um, no, matter, no matter what the future, future holds, I know that God will never let go. And um, I pray that you know that as well. Um, this morning we are going to be continuing our sermon series, Christ in All of Life. And we are going to be looking at um, the topic of Christ and suffering. Christ and suffering. And we're going to do this in two parts. Um, so but before we get into it, let's um, open in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for who you are, Lord, and what you have done for us, Lord. And um, Lord, I, I pray, Lord, that um, you, who you are will be right before us all the time. And, I, I, and Lord, I pray, Father, that as we continue our worship of you this morning, that um, looking into your word, I pray you speak to us, Lord, through your word in these few moments we have together. And Lord, I pray that um, I would say only the things you want me to say. And guide, guide us by your spirit and Holy Spirit, we welcome you to fill us individually, fill us corporately, and, and illumine our hearts um, and apply the eternal word to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. As you know, we have been talking about Christ um, in all of life. Christ in all of life, Paul said in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, for me to live is Christ. And we've been asking and answering, what does it look like to walk with Christ in all of life? What does it look like to keep Christ center in all aspects of our life? What does it look like, for example, in our friendships, in our family? What does it look like at work? And these are just some of the questions we've been asking and answering. And this morning, um, we are looking at Christ and suffering. And I thought um, uh, we'll talk about suffering in, in two weeks, in, in just two, two parts. One, just talking about suffering in general. And then, and then next, talk about what it looks like to fellowship in Christ's sufferings. Um, but so to talk about um, suffering this morning... We are going to look at the book of Job. What a place to look, right? The book of Job. Uh, the old, one of the oldest b books in the entire Bible. And it's very powerful. Um, you know, suffering is an important topic. As I was preparing for this, I told my brother and sister that when I was, uh, when I was an undergrad at Moody Bible Institute, I was told the hardest, most, diff most difficult class there was the, a class called The Theology of Suffering. I never, never got to take it because my, I was trying to get my course load done. But in spite of that, a lot of the students that would take that class would always come to ask me for help with their homework. And I always would say, I don't know if I should be insulted by that or complimented by that, right? <laughs> but the truth is, is um, the, the, the school of suffering is, is one that every one of us are going to have to take at one, one point in our life, no matter who you are. And, and I, as I look out at all of you, and, and I know people watching online, the truth is you've been through much more suffering than I have experienced. A lot of you have been through some pretty tough times. A lot of you experienced death of people closest to you, lost houses and jobs, and um, just suffering. There's suffering all around us in our culture um, now with uh, um, just the things going on in our, our economy. But this, this topic of suffering is important regardless of, of the fact that the election is Tuesday, has nothing to do with it, and or COVID, suffering has been with us, and it's been with us um, for a very long, for ever since the Garden of Eden, and which is which is likely why Job was one of the, one of the first books written. Um, and we're going to look at this book and ask the question, is there any comfort uh, when there are no answers? Because I don't know what your experience is with suffering, but Many times for me, there's there's no there's no answers. There's lo no logical reason for it. You can you can't get any answers from from God. So what do we do? Is there any comfort in suffering? Is there a purpose for suffering? You know, every time I go through, um, I've been, been through some tragedies, like like many of you have, and I'm always um, a little bummed out at the fact that people always seem to have a lot of what they think is good advice of all times, right? I mean, you, you just sometimes want to tell people, just please, you know, like it, like like Job says, sh show wisdom by not by holding your tongue, right? What what can you say to people? Oftentimes, what they say, they think it's comfort. It's no comfort at all. And and when they when they're gone, when the kids are in bed, and you're by all by yourself, you you you're sitting up thinking, is there anyone who can offer me words of comfort? Can help me make sense of this? So what do we do to find comfort in the midst of sufferings? Well, as we look at the experience of Job and the story of Job, 
Um, he, we, he shares with it, we learned some insights from his experience because he has some firsthand experience. We have three insights we can see from this book. First of all, to suffer victoriously, to have to suffer um, properly in, in an overcoming way, we need, we need to focus, we need to know God's character. Suffering and, and being victorious, first of all, begins with knowing God's character. Now, you guys know the storyline of the book of Job, I'm sure. Many of you, many of you do. Um, the story begins, and Job is on top of the world. He has a perfect family. His finances are rock solid, and his faith is secure. And on Job's religious landscape, there's not a, a cloud of, of, of uh, trowel or suffering in this, in, in anywhere to be seen. And, and it's at this point that we learn in chapters 1 and chapter 2 that Satan is, appears before the throne of God with all, the, with all the rest of the angels. And God asks him where he's been, and he says, I've been going to and fro. And, and God, it's God who actually says, have you considered my servant Job? And they, they have a conversation. And, and he's, there's no one like him, God says. And he's just, can you imagine him saying that about you? Can you uh, look at Freaky down there. Have you seen Freaky? Which I'm glad he doesn't, by the way. He says, have you considered Job? And, and uh, Satan says, yeah, I've seen him. You know why he's faithful to you just like everyone else? Because you're good to him. You have to buy people's worship is basically what the devil is telling God. And so God gives him permission to, you know the story, God gives him permission to, um, to, to inflict trials upon Job. And Job loses his, his, all his children, everything he owns, and he's, he's destitute. And, um, and, and right then, it's right then and there that he utters some of the most famous words of the Bible where he says, Hey, naked I've come into the world and, and from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. It's very impressive, right? Um, so he passes that test, and Satan goes back to God's throne, and he says, um, "He says, yeah, that's because you won't let me touch him. If you let me harm him, he'll he'll deny you to your face." So, so that, he gives Satan permission to go and inflict bodily harm on him, but not. But he tells him the whole time, "Don't touch. Don't. You can't take his life. You can't do anything to take his life away from him." So he inflicts boils on on Job and. And again, um, he, he has all, all these things, sores, and he's, he's actually using pottery to try to do surgery on himself to find some comfort. He's sitting on an ash heap, and, uh, and his wife comes up to him and says, why don't you just curse God and die? You know, of all, of all things, how about that, fellas? Your, your wife's saying something like that, right? But again, Job responds in a very powerful way. Um, he says, shall we accept good, for, good from God and not trouble? Job, Job seems, he's a, he's a very impressive guy. But as it turns out, Job's faith is, 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 a, is, a, is his grandpa's faith. You know, some people have this faith that seems like it's passed down to them from their, from their, uh, from their parents or from their grandparents. Job knows all, these, all the answers about God on a test. Right? He can take a test about God. I mean, he was, Job was, he's, he says it in, in verse 5 of chapter 42 in the end of this book, he says, my ears have heard. So he's heard all these things. He, he's been taught. He's been to BBS. He's been to, Job went to Sunday school. He's been to youth camp. And Job's, Job's ears have been taught and he's heard and been taught all the wisdom of tradition. It's been drilled into him. He aced the, the catechisms. He won the Junior League Bible drills. He's been taught. But you know, sometimes life storms are, are, are very serious. It's one thing to hear about the storms, but it's an altogether different thing to experience storms for yourself. So here Job sits on, the, on this, on this uh, ash heap, trying to hang on to some meaning of the things he thinks he knows. But you know, borrowed answers while well, he suffice you for a short period of time. Sooner or later, in the midst of suffering, you're going to have to come up with some answers of your own. So Job's suffering is real and it's poignant. It's terrifying. And it's just, and it's just at that point that in chapter 2, verse 11, Job's three friends come. And they, they coordinate their business. They live in different places. And they travel so they can arrive, arrive at the same exact time. And, and when, they, when they arrive... Um, to, to see Job, it says this in, in verse 11 of chapter 2. It says, Now when Job's three friends heard all of this evil that had come upon him, they each, they each, from his own, each came from his own place. Eliphaz, the, the, the Temite, 
Bildad, the, the Shulite, and Zophar, the, the Na- Namite, they made, an, they made an appointment together to come to show sympathy and comfort to, to, to Job. It says, and when they saw him from a distance, they didn't recognize him. And, and, they, and they raised their voices and wept. They tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads, and, and on their dead, heads toward heaven. And they sat with Job on the ground for seven days, seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him. For they saw that his suffering was very great. Can you imagine this? I could tell you the first thing that you should learn if you want to do a pastoral visit is, is try to be positive when you arrive, right? It's because you want to reassure people, try to give them assurance it's going to be okay. And I'm sure these guys had the same intention. But Job looked so bad that they, that they saw him from a distance and they were completely undone and they sat in silence for seven whole days. But they would make up for that silence in, in, in much of the rest of the book. So it's right then that we, the, in, in chapter 3 to chapter 37, this whole big section of the book of Job, the most boring part, some of you might think, and they go, they have, they, there's three cycles of questions. His, his three friends are, are asking Job questions, and he's giving answers, and, and evidently their questions are making Job more and more and more, and more depressed. And, and, and his three friends that just keep going back and forth with Job. And, and it's important that this section is important because, you know, getting perspective and, and coming to grips with, with um, what God's doing in your life, especially through suffering, takes time. And you have to ask the, the, the honest questions. So after the seven days is over, Job is not nearly as, as um, positive and upbeat as he was in, in, in the, prior to this. So from chapter 3 to 37, Job, in chapter 3, in fact, is, is one of the most uh, more depressing chapters in the Bible other than Leviticus, chapters of Leviticus. But Job, but Job is experiencing this perfect storm. And, and chapter 30, verse, verse 15 to 22, describes the Job's storm perfectly. He, Job says, terrors are turned upon me. My honor is pursued as, as the wind, and my prosperity has passed away like a cloud. And now my soul is poured out within me. Days of affliction have taken hold of me. The, 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 night, racks, the, the night racks my bones, and the pain gnaws and, and takes no rest. With great force, my garments are disfigured. It, it binds me about like, like a collar from my tunic. God has cast me into the mire. And I have become like dust and ashes. I cry to you for help, and you don't answer me. I stand, and you only, and you, and you only look at me. You have turned cruel to me. With the, with the might of your hand, you have, perse- you have persecuted me. You lift, you lift me up on the wind. You make me ride on it. And you toss me about on the, on the roar of the storm. So evidently, this is it, it, this is getting real for Job. You see, now these these placid answers won't work anymore. These answers on a quiz. Now it's time for Job to come up with some of his own. And meanwhile, all his friends are are, are telling Job that it's his, it's a result of his wick, wickedness that he's suffering. His his friends, much like Job, have, a, have such a limited view of God that they don't think there could be any possible purpose in suffering other than punitive. That you did something wrong, and you must have did something really wrong because the the, the, the how great your suffering is it means that that's how great your your wickedness has been. So Job is getting they're getting to him, and Job's getting more and more um, uh, depressed. And he say, he says a bunch of things, and and he says two things in all in the midst of all these three, these thirty some chapters, two things. He did two things that were wrong. He, he implicated God. He said that God was an uncaring God. He said that he said that God must must not understand. God must not be really kind at all. He must not care about people because, because he let these things happen. I mean, in one sense, you see that Job knows that God is sovereign. He knows that this couldn't have got passed without God's approval. Well, he said he, he accuses God of being uncaring. And not, not only that, Job also said that what had happened to him was evidence that even if God did care, he's not in control. That, that everything is in chaos. You know, like deists, they say that God wound up the universe and he just kind of watches it roll into chaos. So Job accuses God of two things. You don't care, and you're not able, and even if you are, even, even if you do care, you're not able to do anything. 
And those are two charges that I think that every one of us are guilty of throwing against, charging God with from time to time. Sure, sometimes we don't do it loudly. And, you know, I, I tell my wife all the time, I, I don't feel like I do this, but I, but I know the truth is I do it like everyone else. Maybe we don't say it out loud, but suddenly, quietly, we, 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 under our breath, maybe we say, God, you don't really understand my sorrow. Do you really know? God, do you really care? And then as the trial gets, gets harder or the temperature gets hotter, we say, God, are you really in control at all? And it's interesting. If you, if you study the Bible, God doesn't, doesn't defend much, but he, but he does stand up to defend who he is, his character, his, his very nature. So Job goes on. He goes on in these, in these chapters to say that he wished he had never been conceived. He goes on. He's, he says that and because he was conceived, he wishes he would have died at childbirth. And then he says, because God is greater than either of these, he wishes that God would just take, take his life right then, then and there in his present circumstances. In chapter 31, verse 35, he says, oh that, I, oh, that I had one to hear me. Let the Almighty answer me. In the midst of Job's suffering, he cries out to God. And he raises a question that you and I have raised to God repeatedly. In fact, it's a question that I, that I dread. People tell me that I'll dread when I hear, glory, hear from glory joy. And that question is, why? Why, God? Why? Three times in the book of Job, he says to God, answer me, God. He demands God. He says, tell me why. I want to know why. The first thing, the first principle we find here to, uh, to, to persevere through trials is we, we, in, we find comfort in suffering by knowing God's character. Second thing we see, to find comfort in suffering, we need to know how God speaks. To find comfort in suffering, we need to know how to hear God's voice. That's a good prayer to pray for your children, by the way. And so in chapters 38 to, to 42, the last section of the book, it's broken up into, into three parts. God speaks to Job. And what's amazing about God speaking to Job is he speaks to Job out of a whirlwind. In the Bible, a storm is often the occasion for which God reveals himself. It's like the storm that brought Job to ruin in the first place and destroyed his family. But this time, it's a similar whirlwind, God is, God is bringing revelation. He's not bringing tragedy. He's bringing dis disclosure. This is interesting. God, God's response comes from within the storm, and Job is in it. Right? He's not out in, the, out in the sunshine watching in. It comes from the storm, within the storm. It comes from within the wrestling. Do you know the only real answers that you and I are ever going to get is from within the storm itself? Don't ever waste a trial. Don't ever waste a storm. God, God will turn your misery into a ministry. He'll turn your storm into a platform of his grace. The only meaning that will mean anything at all will come from the storm. The truth that Job needs, the only truth that's big enough for Job's experience comes from the storm. It will come from this experience. And we hear this wisdom all throughout scripture, don't we? The stone that that the stone that is the stumbling block will become will eventually become the cornerstone. You talk to anybody that's been through some great suffering, great suffering, and they've done it and they've went through it redemptively, they'll tell you something about this truth. The cross, the cross that becomes your cross, leads to life. Do you know this is the central truth of the entire Bible? God speaks to the world in a moment that seems like, to, seems like meaningless suffering to the rest of the world. Paul talked about this. He said, the cross is foolishness to some, he told the Corinthians. But to us, it is our salvation. Job understands a bit of this principle. And, I, and from knowing some of you, I, I, I think some of you understand this as well. God speaks to us out of the storm. And when he does, 
There are, there are a few things about God's speech that we need to recognize. First, God really, he doesn't, he doesn't scold Job. No, he, you, know, some, you read, he asked him 70 questions, and there are 28 questions, but he doesn't, he doesn't say, shame on you, Job, you should have known better. In fact, at the, end of, and at the end of the story, God tells Job's friends that Job was right all along. He says Job was innocent, and he says he was indeed silent. God doesn't scold Job, but there's, but there's another thing, and this is the second thing that we need to notice. God never explains anything either. Did you notice that? He never explains anything. He never answers Job's questions. Instead, God, God speaks like a, like a poet, not a philosopher. He doesn't speak like a theologian. And thank goodness he doesn't speak like a preacher with three points that all begin with the same letter, right? God speaks as a poet. Do you know this is the longest speech of God's in the entire Bible in its poetry? I think that's significant for us to notice. It tells us something about the way that God speaks to our soul. God speaks to us through things that are beautiful. And so here, God's word comes in, in, in rhyme, and in image after image after image. The form is important. Do you know that Job, and some of you have learned this, Job, he won't be led back by arguments, proof texts, or, or points. No, when you're in a storm, you can't think your way out of that. You can't think your way out of a storm. Rationality and reason, they're not going to go far, very far in a storm. There's no textbooks when you're in the midst of, in the midst of a storm. There's no scientific explanation in fact, when, you get, when, you're, when you're in a storm, it's as if, like one author put it, he says that you get to the very edge of reason itself. And if you're there long enough, you'll discover what Job discovered. The truth that Pascal, or what Pascal meant when he said, reason, reason's last step is to recognize that an in infinity of things lies beyond it. The only way out of a storm is through something that's deeper than logic. A deeper kind of wisdom that only art, poetry, or beauty can point to. So God doesn't answer Job's question. Now, he, should, he just gets an, gives an invitation for Job to, to shut his mouth and to open his eyes. Isn't that interesting? I mean, God, God shows Job image after image. I mean, just, just listen. Close your eyes and listen to the picture that, that God was painting for Job. He, 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 he talked to Job about the morning light, the sea, the showers of rain and hail and snow, the majesty of the stars, the mystery of the constellations, the lion and the goat, the moth and the donkey, the wild ox and the horse, the soaring hawk and the soaring eagle. God goes on and on and on. And Job listens. And, 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 and somewhere along the line, Job begins to see all that's around him. And, and through seeing what's all around him, he, gets, he starts to sense what's beyond him. One, one commentator says, he feels, he feels it, the mysterious rhythm and rhyme of creation, the fathomlessness of nature and of the cosmos. He, gets, he begins to feel it deep with the inside of his own body. Job begins to sense the God who created all of this and, 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 and the, the life of God pulsating through all of creation. God goes on and on and on, and Job begins to experience God's grandeur, God's otherness, God's love and his care, his omnipotence, his, his transcendence. And he, he begins to sense God's intimacy and his presence in all things. And this is what motivates Job to move beyond his journey. And, and through, through all of those pictures, he, he, he gives a couple of pictures to Job to point to his power and, and, his, and his care for, for creation. I mean, and, but he does it through, through poetry, through images. That's what art and beauty do. That's what, that's what art and beauty does. One author, um, uh, John O'Donohue, has this great line in his book. He says, the wonderful, 
The, the wonder of the beautiful, he writes, the wonder of the beautiful is its ability to, to surprise us with swift, sheer grace. It's like a divine breath that blows our, our hearts open. That's what, that's beauty. That's what beauty in all its forms, art, music, poetry, creation, that's what, that's what it does. Three principles for persevering victoriously through, through suffering. First, to find comfort in suffering, we need to know God's character. Second, to find comfort in suffering, we need to know how God speaks. And third, to suffer victoriously, to find comfort in suffering, we need to respond to God's revelation of himself. To, to, to find comfort in suffering, we need to respond to God's revelation of himself. And here God, Job responds to God's replies. And so the poetic speech begins to open up his heart. And it's pulling on, pulling on Job. It's mysterious. But you can see that it begins to, to change Job. I mean, he has, he has much fewer things to say. That's, first of all, uh, uh, a uh, proof that something's changing in him. I've always been told, never pass up the opportunity to say nothing. You know? but, but at the end of all the speeches, Job confesses. He says, my ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. See, now Job sees in a way that wasn't possible before. This Job sounds way different than the Job we read about in, in chapters 3 to 30 to, 30 to 37. And this Job is radically different than the Job that we read about in chapters 1 and 2. Job has moved to a new level of faith, and this faith isn't borrowed. It's not inherited. It's not passed down to him. Now Job knows at a different level. It's not rational. Now, no, there's still no answers given. I mean, it's not as if Job says, oh, I get it. Sorry, I was confused. I, I see now. None of that. Nothing is cleared up. Nothing. Right? But now, now somehow Job understands. And this is how our faith journey works. Just like Job. At first I heard. I've heard about you. I've known about it for years. I learned about it in Sunday school. But now I see. And yet this is, where, this is where the dark night was always taking Job. It's where the dark night's always taken us. Sooner or, later, sooner or later in our lives, we will have the opportunity and the privilege of knowing who God is for ourselves. That's where we, that's where we find the answer. Is there any comfort when there seem to be no answers? Because most of our life is spent living in that sphere. Of course, my answer is yes. There is comfort. And that comfort comes in the reliance on the revealed character of God. Comfort comes from the, from the reliance on the revealed character of God. You know, God doesn't give an explanation. He gives a revelation. God, God has revealed himself to us truly. And he has. But he's not revealed himself completely. Let me ask you, do you, do you regularly spend time with the Lord Wanting to get a, a glimpse of who he is, focusing on who he is. The Apostle Paul says, We become what we behold. That sounds pretty scary to think about some of the things we behold, but that's also an opportunity. God has called us to a confident faith that's a real faith. You know, I, I think in, uh, in our times, we tend to, to um, pervert the view of God to some kind of uh, parental, uh, parental character, like he's our parent. But somehow along the line, we forget about God's transcendence. We talked about that over the summer. See, not only does God love us, he's above us. And he controls all of life circumstances. Even the devil, Irwin Luther says, is God's devil. No wonder worship. You know, if, if, if we reduce God, like some people do, to the, the sum of some argument or the sum of some finite knowledge, it, our worship will be sterile and it will be dry. There's no explanations here. There's no justification here. All we have is the overwhelming of Job by the revelation of God's ways. You know, Hope was talking about her mother um, during worship time. And I've shared before, three years before her, her mother passed away, she was diagnosed with a rare disease called Wegman's disease. Not, no, not named after the Wegmans, of course. 
Um, and and the, the hospital didn't know a whole lot about it. They were trying to learn more things about it. But it mimics leukemia, and she was getting treated the same as a leukemia patient you know, on chemo. And she was in a, in a vegetative state. And my mother died uh, that way. And um, when, when that happens to you, you tend to get cynical about when you see someone else in that circumstance on a ventilator. Well, Hope's mother was on that ventilator, and I was trying to prepare Hope for um, what I thought was gonna, might happen. And, um, and she, she was in that, in that state on that ventilator in a, in, in a comatose state for weeks. And they, they couldn't understand why. One day I come home and I hope she's crying and she's on the phone, you know. And I said, I said who are you talking to? She says, Mom. And Hope hands me the phone and um, it's like I get a call from the grave, you know. It's like, she says, how you doing, kiddo? You know. And um, Hope's mother was very, very kind and godly. Very, very, had a very sweet spirit about her. And I said, how in the world am I talking to you? And she said, oh, you never believe this. And she tells me this story. She says, I, you guys were in there and I can hear you. You know, they're, they're, you, people look down and they say, can they, can, do you think she can hear us? She says, and I heard everything. And she says, including in the middle of the night, the nurses would come in on third shift and they would say, why don't they let this lady die? You know? uh, she has she had enough? And she says, let me tell you, if you're in that state, you're scared. <laughs> You know, what's going to happen? She's so scared. And she said, I would just hear them saying that all the time. She said, one night I somehow woke up and I was able to take my little, my uh, vent out in the hallway. And the first person I saw was a nurse. I said, excuse me, nurse, can you pray with me? Um, and um, the nurse is like, why, you know, pray with you? She said, yeah, pray with me. The nurse says, you don't understand who you're talking to here. God doesn't want to hear from me. She says, oh, yes, he does. You know, I, I need God. I need God. I just need to pray to God. You know? So the nurse gets down on her, her hands and knees in the hallway and prays the Lord's Prayer with my mother-in-law. And she's telling me this story, not realizing how profound it is and maybe feel so humbled on the spot of some of the things I talk about. You know, um, In that moment, she knew that all she needed was, was God himself, God's character. And, um, and it's interesting um, and how, how that I learned from that experience. But when she, three years later, she did pass away. And Hope went out to help go through some of the things. And she found, like, pictures stuffed into the sides of the chair. She couldn't, get, she couldn't breathe and she couldn't move. And so she'd draw. She'd draw all these, all these pictures of two stick figures. And she wrote on the bottom, God and me walking off into eternity. The comfort that we get is, is in the knowledge that everything will be all right because everything's under control. I pray that you've come to that place. That when you have that, you have everything. You, I, I pray you've come to the place in life, so no matter what, but what befalls you, that you know how to sit and get in, in, in your quiet place and to, to, to put yourself into the loving arms of a God who loves you and a God who's in complete control. He cares, he, as, as he says in these, as Job says in these verses, he cares for the goats. He, he says to Job, I care for the goats and the deer and the mountains. I care for you, I care for you too. God is infinite, and man is finite. You know, someone once called me and um, just told me of a terrible circumstance of going in their life of a death. And in that moment, I mean, what, what in the world do you think could I say to somebody like that? Well, I say to him, I said to him, but I say to anybody in that circumstance. And it's captured in the gospel song. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. Is there comfort when there are no answers? Well, there sure is. The comfort doesn't come from an explanation. The comfort comes from, from a revelation, from, from a knowledge of, of who God is. So let's pray. <clears throat> Father, I thank you, Lord, for, I thank you that you are in control. Lord, I thank you that you're in complete control of our lives. And I pray, Lord, for those here, Lord, who don't have that privilege of, of that no knowledge, Lord, I pray that you bring them to that place, Lord. Lord, of course, that, that, that begins, Lord, with, in, on, on this side of the cross, um, of, with inviting Jesus into our lives, Lord. Lord, we know that Jesus Christ is your most clear revelation of who you are, Lord. Lord, we know you can relate to suffering and you can relate to, to death, because you mourn the death of, of your son 
Lord, we th- I thank you, Lord, that, um, that, for the, that you've spoken in the past uh, through prophets and through various ways, but now you speak to us through your own son. And I pray, Lord, that we would um, um, get a, a, a more broader and deeper revelation of who you are um, through um, your son, Jesus Christ, Lord. And, and Lord, and we thank you, Lord, that you have so loved the world that you gave your only son, Lord, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And I thank you, Father, for... Um, the truth of who you are. And I pray, Lord, for, for those who, are, who don't know you, Lord, that you soften their hearts. And I pray for those here who are suffering, Lord, and there are people, and those who are listening. I pray, Lord, that you would um, help give them revelation of who you are, Lord, that they could find comfort no matter what the circumstances are. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.